All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 6. If you found that, why don't you stand and we'll read together God's Word. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 6, we'll start in verse 1 and read down to verse 9. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. Let's begin verse 1. <clears throat> There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, and yet God does not give him the power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a, man, if a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things and he has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and it goes in darkness and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, and yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, and yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the same place? All the toil of man is for his mouth. Yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? What does the poor man have who, who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the soul or the appetite. This is vanity. It's striving after the wind. Join me as we pray. For every discontented soul, we pray for a miracle. Those that are dead in sin, we ask that miraculously you might save them in Christ today. For those in Christ but battling the clouds of depression and anxiety and fear. Pray that divine rays, sunshine, would burst forth today. It's our souls, Lord. It's our souls that need you. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. We are halfway through the book of Ecclesiastes, and it is as if the preacher, that's what Solomon calls himself, it's as if the preacher has been reading our mail. How does he know? How does he know how empty we sometimes feel inside? How did he find out about the hollowed out dark place in your soul? How does he know that although you have every reason to be happy, yet you still seem to come up short? How does the preacher know that you are not completely content, that you keep thinking, you don't mean to, but you keep thinking there's got to be more to life than this. Here in chapter 6, the preacher has brought us back down. You hear it in the language in verse 1. He has brought us back down to life here on earth. He describes life here on earth as living under the sun 
And it's Solomon. Remember who wrote this now. It's Solomon. He's looking at his riches and his women and his power. He's, he's thinking about his standing as the wealthiest man in the world. And he looked around and says, Is this it? Now remember, Ecclesiastes does not lack the gospel. The, the book here, Ecclesiastes, is here to show us our need for the gospel. And chapter 6 looks further into our souls than any chapter yet as he silences all the noise and all the clatter and all the busyness of life and says, it's your soul. You've catered to every other part of who you are except your soul. And part of what the preacher is saying in this passage is, if you don't get the soul work right, then none of the other successes, none of the other enjoyments in life will matter. So what I'd like to do is for the next few moments before we go into the Lord's Supper, what I'd like to do for the next few moments is use this passage and let's just let this passage examine our discontented soul. Because a discontented soul will never be satisfied. You a discontented soul? A discontented soul will never be satisfied. Let's take a look here at what, uh, what the preacher has done for us, and he's offered up the picture of a discontented soul. First thing I want you to see is in verse 1, and that is that a, discon a discontented soul won't deal with the real problem. Let's find out what the real problem is. Let's go to verse 1 and read it, and let's read it slowly, and notice what he says in verse 1. <clears throat> there is an evil that I have seen, under the sun. In other words, life here on earth. The preacher looks around. I see people as they are. There is an evil as we live here on earth. And this is what I've seen. Verse 1. It lies heavy on mankind. That is to say, it covers all of mankind. It's not that it's just heavy. It is absolutely universal. There is no person that is exempt. Now, later on in verse 2, the preacher will put a finer point on what it is that he's talking about. But for right now, he brings up a universal problem that is common to every person that has ever been born since Cain and Abel. And that is that we are sinners. Sin is not just something we do, sin is something we are. And that sin, according to what the preacher says in verse 1, is it, it lays heavy on us. It, it's, it, it's in the air we breathe, it's in the water we drink, it's in the food we eat, it's in, it's in the people that we love, it's in the actions we take. Every bit of that is tainted in some way with sin. It's good for you to remember that, that at your nature, you in fact are a sinner. It's good to remember that you are no different than everyone else. Sin has come in some form into your life, not just you. You have felt the effects of sin. Sin has weighed heavy on your life. Sin has blurred your vision. Sin affects your decisions. Sin is at the very root of whatever, whatever discontentment that you have. Remember who wrote this now? Solomon, he's an older man. Solomon as an older man, remember the sequence, Solomon as a young man wrote the Song of Solomon. Go and read that. You know that only a young man would write that. And then after the Song of Solomon, uh, in, in middle age, he writes Proverbs. This is how you live your life. And then here Ecclesiastes as an older man, looking back, Solomon is an older man now. And he can look back over his life and see where he made a mess of things. And he sees that at the root, 
at the root of all of the societal, relational, vocational issues that any of us have, at the root of it is the fact that we are sinful people. I, I think this, honestly, <clears throat> I think this is what's lacking in, in what is known as gospel preaching. I think it's lacking in gospel preaching when you're not preaching that people are sinners. People can't understand the gospel that saves sinners if they don't understand that they're actually sinners. I think this is lacking in gospel preaching today and pointing out the root of what our issues are. The root of our issues from racism to narcissism to boredom, the root of it is the insidious nature of sin. This insidious nature of sin that's gone into the very DNA of who we are. And until you can actually come to grips with the fact that you are a sinner and that sin runs deep into who you are, until you can really think through the depth of your sin and what is that it has affected in you, you can never really know how unbelievably good the gospel of Jesus Christ is. We, we can't understand God's goodness and holiness and the fact that He created you in His image. If you don't understand that you as a sinner are separated from God, and not just separated, actually the Bible says dead in sin, that means without hope. And the gospel is that out of love, his own love, for no good reason, out of love, he gives us Jesus living perfectly, dying on the cross in the place of sinners. God raised him from the dead. And the gospel is, if you will repent and believe, believe you, can do, you can do that while I'm preaching. You can in your seat call on God to save you on the merits of what Jesus has done. Ask him to save you. Now, if you are a Christian already, then what you and I need to be doing as Christians, we need to do what John Owen, the Puritan, said. John Owen said that you are to be killing sin or sin will be killing you. We need to be fighting sin. We, we need to deal with the real, the real problem of our discontentment. So as we think about that point, I'll just ask a couple of questions. Is Jesus Lord? If you're watching online or here in the room and, and you've... You've walked an aisle before or you've been baptized and there's actually nothing in your life that gives any evidence that you're a Christian. You can't rely on the fact that you were baptized or that you even prayed the sinner's prayer. That's not what's going to save you. It's a yielding to Jesus as Lord, seeing Him not just as Savior, but as the absolute sovereign in your life as Jesus Lord. For those of you that are, that are Christians, are you, are you discontented because there's some secret sin, there's some unconfessed sin, there's some sin that you're battling with that maybe no one knows about, and you need to give that over to God? Or, or maybe, maybe you're really a, a, really a pretty good Christian as it goes, but there's some idolatry in your life. You've, you've put something ahead of who God is in your life. Maybe it's even something good like your child or someone you love. Or possibly, you believe all of these things that the Bible says, but you're just a complainer. You just complain. Complain. You know, you know, most of the Old Testament can be condensed down to one sentence. God does not like complaining. Go read a little bit in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. Maybe you just, you don't appreciate some of the things you've been through, and so you become, and you need to confess that. Or maybe, possibly, your, your pain has gone it's gone so deep into your soul that you're having a hard time actually trusting God. And, and at the root of that is, is sin. See, a discontented soul won't deal with the real problem. Will you come to the cross of Jesus and deal with that problem? Let's leave that there and let's go to the second point, number two. If a discontented soul won't deal with the real problem, here's the second point. A discontented soul doesn't recognize the real solution. The problem of sin, that, that's what causes the discontentment. There is a solution. You'll see it there in verse 2. We read through verse 1. Let's go to verse 2 
And when you read verse 2, you won't see it at first because it's kind of hidden there in verse 2. Uh, it's hidden in the preacher's description of the problem, but in his description of the problem is the actual solution. And just on a personal level, this has been something that's actually been very helpful to me personally in the last year. So I'm going to read verse 2, and there are two things I want to talk about in verse 2. I'll label them like this. I want to talk about the good provision of God. We're going to talk about the good provision. And we're going to talk about the hard providence. Two things. Good provision, that's real pleasant. Hard providence, not so pleasant. Not so pleasant. Let's read verse, verse 2 and find it there. Notice what he says. Here's the scenario. A man to whom God, it's God, God gives wealth and possessions and honor so that he lacks nothing that he desires. That is really good, yet God does not give him the power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. That's vanity. That's evil. Let's deal with the good part first, good provision. The good provision is found right there in the beginning of verse 2. It's God gives. God gives. Notice he says that to us, that it's God doing the giving. God gives wealth. God gives possession. God gives honor. God gives all that you want, he says in verse 2. When you read that and you pause right there, you find out there is a real God-centeredness. There's a real God-awareness right here in the text that most of us actually don't have. We, we sort of assume provision. You know how you, you've been assuming something? Uh, you know you've been assuming it, that when it's gone, you're frustrated at it. So, for instance, when a storm comes through and the lights go out, it's frustrating. We're wondering, why can't they get the lights back on? We've assumed that provision. What if, <clears throat> what if God stripped you bare of everything? What if God took away every article of clothing, every particle of food, every stick of furniture, every friend, every relative, everyone you loved, every convenience that you experienced? What if he took every one of those things that you don't thank him for? You see, this dissatisfaction or discontentment, that is the enemy of gratitude. When you're discontented, you're not thankful. But flip that over, thankfulness or gratitude is the killer of dissatisfaction. When I say thankful, I mean thankful to God. To live in a constant awareness that all of this is God's. It is, it is, it is God and His kindness that that He has provided for you, even, even the little while that you're here. And I don't mean just His uh, common grace where He makes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust and the sun to shine on the just and the un... I'm not talking about just common grace. I'm talking about the, the specific kindness that He has given His children. The little things that He's given you, even if for a while, and his plan is perfect. And if his plan is perfect, and if this is his world, and if all things belong to him, and if he is the potter, and I am the clay, how can that which is being molded say to the molder, why are you doing this? I deserve better than this. I, 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 wonder, <clears throat> I wonder how much of your life and attitude and, and, and lack of commitment would change if you started recognizing God's immediate provision in your life. His constant and immediate provision in your life. This whole verse is packed with God's provision on the front end of verse 2, but there in the middle of verse 2 it takes a... It takes a turn, and it's a negative one. At the end of verse 2 is the other thing that I wanted, wanted you to see here that we have much more trouble dealing with, and that is hard providence. Hard providence. 
Go back and read it, and I'll, I'll tell you why I say hard providence, that is God doing it, because the way Job, I'm sorry, the way that, uh, that Solomon writes it here is it is God. Let's read verse 2. A man to whom God gives wealth and possessions and honor so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, and yet God, it's God doing this, does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. This is a grievous evil. This is a sickness is really what that translation is. Things are going well. <clears throat> Money's coming in. Providing for my family. Things look really good. People think highly of me. And something happens. See all these great things. We don't know the scenario. Maybe there's a loss of job. Maybe a... Uh, Maybe somebody dies, something happens, and God takes all of these things away. He takes away the ability to even enjoy what you've actually been working for. Either way, the text is indicating in the scenario, now somebody else is enjoying the fruits of all your labor. All that labor at the beginning of verse 2, all that work, it was a gift as well. You know what this is a reminder? You kind of put this in parentheses. <clears throat> this is a reminder that all of our best and coolest and most valued possessions will one day be in an estate sale. Somebody will have them. And the preacher says this, at the very end of verse 2, is a grievous evil. This is a, this is a sickening truth. But it brings us back to the worldview of providence. <clears throat> you know, I, I slipped up and, and said Job a moment ago. The reason is I'm thinking about Job. This, this book is so, has so much in common with the book of Job. Remember in Job chapter 1, uh, how it opens up. And, and there in Job chapter 1, the Sabians came down and attacked his children and killed them. And then a fire from God fell on the sheep, burned them up. And then a wind from God blew and knocked down a building that the rest of his children were in. I mean, go ahead and read it. And he's devastated. Job's not, in, he's not impassive. He is struck down. I mean, it crushed him. And in his grief, remember what he said? Job 1, verse 21 and 22. Job said, naked. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the narrator in, in, in the book of Job, the narrator says, In all of this, Job did not sin, and he did not charge God with wrong. At, at the end of that chapter, chapter 1, uh, his wife, she was a real encourager, his wife says, You should curse God and die. And Job says, shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive the bad things, the evil too? Listen, if you're hurt or bitter or confused, or, or maybe you would even classify angry at God because of some of the terrible things that have happened, and, and they are terrible things that have happened, don't think that Job just took him on the chin. He, I mean, it knocked him down. I think it's time for you to ask God to help you. Maybe you, have, maybe you need to ask God to forgive you. Maybe you should ask God to give you eyes to see, give you a, a heart to trust His constant and good provision and to walk you through the hard providence. And, and maybe, you, maybe you, you just can't, you're, you're really having a hard time even thinking or seeing clearly, then the best thing I can, I can advise you to do is you go to the cross. This is what Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon would say. You, you come to the cross and, and not only do you find love and forgiveness and grace and mercy at the cross, but it's the wounds at the cross. The wounds of Jesus heal. They'll heal you. There is a solution. There is satisfaction 
and it's found in Jesus. You see, a discontented soul doesn't see the real problem, and the real problem is sin that separates us from God. A discontented soul doesn't see the real solution, and the real solution is what God has given us in Jesus. Which brings me to my third point, number three. A discontented soul will never be satisfied without Jesus. You're, you're here this morning, if by some chance you're watching online, you're not a believer, you're, you're wandering away from the faith of your family, you should know you will not be satisfied until you find your satisfaction in Jesus. I want you to see what the preacher's doing. What, we looked at two verses, now let's take the rest of the passage from verse 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. We'll even include verses 8 and 9. Look what he does here in verse 3. He takes all of the traditional markers of a happy life. Back then and really really right now, some of the, the markers we would say, okay, this looks like a contented life. You, you find it in verse 3. <clears throat> if a man fathers a hundred children, which, by the way, does not sound like much contentment to me. But you get the idea. I mean, he's using hyperbole. What he's saying is, it's the mark of God's blessing on your life that you've had all these children. And he's saying, okay, you think eight or ten's a lot. If a man has a hundred children, verse 3, if he lives many years, or, or drop down to verse 6, he'll say, if you live a thousand years, time two. Think about Methuselah, how old he was, twice that. He's using hyperbole saying, let's say you have all of these markers the traditional markers of God's blessing on your life, but you're still, verse 3, discontented in your soul? If that's the case, the, the preacher says, it, it, is so, it is so bad for you. It takes a really dark turn right here in verse 3. He said, it's so bad for you that it would be better to be miscarried, stillborn. Now, there, there's enough of you here that have gone through a miscarriage. The fact that he would bring this over here and say, you think about all the brokenness and the pain and the heartache and the dreams that are gone, all of that. He says, as painful as that is, that's better than lacking contentment in your soul. Even that is better than your soul wandering. Maybe you find, um, you can come down to verse 7, maybe you find, maybe you find great satisfaction uh, in work. Maybe you like to work, and verse 6 and 7 you find that work, and notice what he says in verse 7 about work. <clears throat> the toil of a man is for his mouth. You eat, you get money, you buy food, you eat the food. Go to bed, wake up hungry, go to work, eat. And that's what you end up doing. And it says that the toil of man is for his mouth. What you're doing, you're working for your mouth. But you see that word appetite in verse 7? That actually is the Hebrew word nephesh. It's the word soul that you've been using over and over again. He says you, you're doing all of that thing to feed your appetite, and what you're lacking is your soul. You miss the whole point of life. You take verse 7 and 8, and he says in verse 7 and 8 that everybody, everybody, here's the equaling fact, equalizing factor, everybody's going to die. Everybody, the wise man and the fool man, the man that's a fool, the, the rich man and the poor man, they're all going to die, and it's your soul. And then in verse 9, he closes out this thought of a soul. Um, he's used the word soul several times. Sometimes it's translated as him or he or man or appetite. He closes out in verse 9, bringing about the sad plight of a wanderer. Let me read it to you. Better is the sight of the eyes, the sight of the eyes, that which is in front of you. Better is that which what God has put right in front of you. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. You see that word appetite? It's the word soul, nephesh. Better is what's here in front of you than a soul 
that wonders. You know what he's talking about here? We would take the New Testament and we would call this, we would call this the prodigal. Wandering into the far country. Some of you know a prodigal. Some of you have a prodigal child. And here's the prodigal. Just wandering. You just can't be satisfied. When, when you had it right there in front of you, everything good was right there in front of you. And a wandering soul, a discontented soul, But it doesn't have to be like that. God has seen our wandering. He has seen our affliction. He's seen our trouble. And He's seen that the trouble that we have is unsolvable without a miracle. And in grace and love, He has given us Jesus. God in His love has given us His Son, Jesus, who lived perfectly, died on the cross in the place of sinners, and the Bible teaches that any one of the wanderers, any soul that's lost, that will turn and believe, that will come to Jesus. You can do that today. Come to Jesus. Be saved. In fact, as I bring this down, and we, we're going to sing in a moment, and then we'll have the Lord's Supper, I bring this down to a close. I, I, I want you just for a moment to pray with me. Just pray. Let's, why don't you pray with me where you are right now? You bow your heads and let's pray. With your heads bowed this morning, I'd like to ask you a question. Do you need Christ to save you? You can be saved today. You can call out to God even where you are and on the merits of Jesus, what Jesus has done on the cross, He will save you because of Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus. Most of you here are probably already believers. So I'm going to say to you, or ask you the question, do you need help as a discontented soul? Now's a good time for you to where you are to, to bring up to the Lord some sin you need to confess. Some, something you need to confess. To, or maybe you just need to ask God like you haven't before. God, please help me. You see my faith, increase my faith. God, thank you for your word that is strong, for your love that is real for your grace that saves us through faith in Jesus. I pray that you would give us a deep contentment in Christ that we can not only celebrate your good provision, but we can walk through the hard problems. Find us faithful and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.